some entertaining exercise. Okay, here, we're, we're, we're real close. We're streaming on Facebook Live. Not yet, just a minute. Okay. Just one that, minute. Was, that was oh. the almost streaming. It's working it out. Um. Go. Good. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Kansas City Oasis. If you remember Kansas City's premier alternative to faith-based community. We are here and wishing everyone a good morning and a welcome. Happy Sunday for all of those watching here on Zoom and on Facebook Live as well. My name is Julie Randolph, and I will be your hostess and MC for today. Glad you guys made it out because we have a really great program for you. Um, we have several people coming to Jessica. Paige will be uh, doing music for us. Everybody say hi, Jessica. Um, we have Adrian Zink, who's going to be doing a speaker, main speaker presentation for us about the history of Kansas. Can't wait to hear from him, learn a little bit more about the state that we either live in or near. And Amanda Worthington, one of our very own community members, will be giving a community moment. Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar, Oasis was founded with the five core values. Um, people are more important than beliefs. Meaning comes through making a difference. Reality is known through reason. Human hands solve human problems and be accepting and be accepted. Um, I did want to let you know, uh, we do try to keep track of our numbers for people attending on Zoom. So if you guys are here with another person, um, if you guys see a couple of your other teammates here, uh, Russ and Sarah put on there, there's two of them individually. Uh, you can either uh, tag in the comments how many people you have watching with you today, or you can change your name in the um, profile settings there. Um, at this time, we'd like to welcome Jessica to bless us with some music, and then we'll go into some announcements straight after that. So Jessica, take it away. Jessica is still dealing with the um, technical oh, hi. issues. Oh, hi. Hello. I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, guys. I'm a Zoom newbie, so I'm, I'm still figuring all of this out. Um, I, I want to just play a new song that I wrote uh, during quarantine because it's fresh on my mind and fresh on my heart. So this is a song called Carry On. Just keep holding on. Okay. 
just keep holding on. Carry on. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, I muted myself. I do one more song, right? Yes, okay, cool. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Um, this next song is uh, my another, another Corona tune. Um, that is correct, Jacob. Um, my uh, neighborhood, I live in this Garrett Renaissance area of um, Kansas City next to the Kansas City Museum. It's beautiful. I love my eclectic neighborhood and we have a lot of families on my street and I come from a small town in Kansas and um, I've lived in apartments all around Kansas City since I've been here for the past like five years and um, this is the first time I've been able to get into a neighborhood again where there's like houses with children and people running around in the street playing games and it was really beautiful and sunny out one day and my roommate and I were sitting out on our yard just watching the commotion and busyness of the street and I was inspired to write this song um called do you see it okay Do you ever think about that little house where we might have lived? Oh, not so little, not so big. Baby, do you see it? I still see it. And I can see you walking through the front door. A little table and chairs on the front porch. Where we have coffee in the morning. Oh, do you see it? I still see it when we were laying on those long winter days, curled into each other in lovers' face. When you would kiss me and say my name. Oh, do you see it? Oh, baby, do you see it? When you close your eyes and kiss another. Quiet street with tall trees, lots of kids and families, with string lights in the springtime, and lemonade on summer nights. Oh, did you see it when we were laying on those cold winter days, coming to each other in a lover's face? When you would kiss me and say my name, oh, did you see it? those are amazing do you have your music posted anywhere especially those new release songs no so these are just two songs that i wrote in the last couple of weeks so i would just thought i'd play you some new songs that were um i was playing around with we'll actually have our first like band practice with them later today but um you can go to uh uh i my, my music uh that I have releases on Spotify, on my website, justpage.com. Um, I mean, you can find it on all the music listening platforms. Um, it's called Beautiful Life. And, uh, or I mean, sorry, Sweet Nothings is the album. Beautiful Life is the single from my last album. And I'll play a, a song from, from that 
uh, later. But uh, Fantastic. thank you so much. Those are great. You know, definitely those we can we can all relate. We're all living the same weird quarantine life. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. Everybody, one more round of applause for Jessica, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I do have a couple quick announcements and then we are going to go into our community moment. So um, look forward to hearing more music from Jessica in a little bit. So for those of you who are participating in our snail mail, um, please make sure you're getting your letters sent out tomorrow. Um, if you can get those sent out before the end of the business day, we're hoping that we can get everybody's letters in the mail and delivered in the next week or so, so that we're all feeling the love from our Oasis families. Um, for those of you who are part of our private page, um, Nikki is our board president and they had posted that June 15th is the earliest date that the board has decided we are going to be considering um, even the notion of meeting again in person in real life in closer-ish proximity to each other, meaning um, a shift from the Zoom meetings. So for those of you who are wondering, you know, how is Casey Oasis responding to the changes? Um, but there's your, there you go. That's your answer. Nothing sooner than June 15th. Um, and then at that time, we'll kind of be more, the board will be reconsidering, you know, where we want to go from there. But and then um, I was thinking about um, many of you know, today is the calendar date from Mother's Day. And I understand that not everybody might have the same background or present day relationships with their moms. But I'd like to encourage everybody to take some time today to think about your mom or maybe a mom figure in your life and just think, think about you know, what they have done to give you love or caring or compassion over the years. And if you're able to reach out to them, then reach out to them and just let them know that you're thinking of them and that you care. Um, even if it's not maybe the person who brought you into the world, um, we all have those special women in our lives. So we want to make sure we're giving thanks to them and celebrating the moms in the world that make the world go around. So, and then of course there's those dads too that are Mr. Dad and Mr. Mom. So don't forget the dads that are Mr. Mom. Um, I have several of those on my on my heart today as well. So thank you again for all of those people in our lives. Um, at this time, I would like to welcome Amanda. Amanda Worthington is a member of our Casey Oasis here. Um, when I was asking Amanda how uh, she would use to, how she would describe herself with three words, she said adventurous, passionate, and resilient. And if she had a warning label, it would be looks before she leaps. So everybody, please welcome Amanda Worthington. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Um, so I thought that um, today, um, just given kind of what we're going through as a society right now, that I would talk a little bit about resilience because I think it's really easy to talk about it in good times and really terrible to talk about it when things are not going so great. So, um, so like everything, so Every word is an origin story. So the word resilient has actually been around for a while. It dates back to a 17th century word um, from Latin, resilere, which simply means to bounce back. And um, it was originally used to refer to the ability of some substances to regain their original shape after being stretched. So it wasn't so much used for humans. Um, we didn't talk about people being resilient for a really long time, actually. Um, it was actually in the 1800s that we started um, talking about people being resilient, but our meaning was a little different. Actually, it comes, um, our specific meaning for that rose from, the, rose from the watch industry of all places, where resilience was a word that was used to refer to certain internal components um, that were used to control excessive vibration. So in the meaning of the 18th century, um, when someone spoke about being resilient, we were talking about being able to not be susceptible to outside pressures. But as um, evolution tends to enlighten us a little bit, we, um, we learned that actually uh, human resilience isn't so much about not being susceptible, it's what we do with the hand that we're dealt. And there's good news there. As a species, we've historically done pretty fabulous. And our evidence for this is that, hey, we're still here, right? So. So um, remember, you're descended from survivors. So I have here um, some information. Um, about 7,500 years ago, Mount Toba erupted. It was a supervolcano, and the out 
um, the fallout from it was immense. And there's some suggestion that it actually created a bottleneck in the species um, where we nearly went extinct. But as it turns out that we're the best when our backs are pressed against the wall, um, we endured. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that um, some of the early humans in Central Europe, in what is today Central Europe, um, they continued their efforts to domesticate a large, lar very large dangerous creature called an auroch. And through these domestication efforts, um, we got our first cows. So um, they had already been, these people had already been using goats and sheep and sheep for their, um, for milking purposes um, to add protein to their diets and, it was probably because of their efforts to domesticate aurochs that they survived because they were able to obviously milk a larger creature. So we've also found stone tools that didn't exist um, prior to the eruption at a site called Daba in central India. And this shows us that people were moving around a lot too. So sometimes, you know, you don't have to stay where you're put. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just, you know, get out of dodge when, when things are not going right. So. Humans are amazing because they learn to cooperate. It's not what we have, it's how we use it. And pooling our resources is what makes us so unstoppable. So early humans survived because of their ability to use tools and work together to take down larger prey, for instance. Specialization was really crucial to our survival and really made so much of what we came to do possible. I also, um, I recently read this article. It's kind of an older one. Um, from 2009, but there's a UC Berkeley psychologist named uh, Dr. Keltner who actually had a book in 2009 called Born to be Kind. He actually makes the argument that kindness itself is how we've survived. Um, so that compassion is hardwired into our genes. So we take care of our own and that's why we're still here. So it's a compelling argument to be kind. And he even suggests that this is wired into our DNA. So in my, in my opinion, I'm gonna throw this out there. This is my little metaphor. Um, I think society is like the gym. You go there to try and improve your life, um, to get some advice for better living, but there is a membership fee. And I think that's important to remember. Sometimes we need help and that's okay, but it's important to remember that we signed that contract for a reason and that we agree to pay the bill when it, when it comes due. And paying the bills in this case, means wearing a mask when the professionals tell you to wear a mask, getting vaccinated, supporting measures that lift us all up. So case in point, we're better together and studies suggest that we're wired to be kind as humans. So maybe society should be wired that way too. And we all have something to offer. I know that at the beginning of this, this kind of situation, there are some people out there suggesting that, oh, only old people are getting sick. So why do we care? Well, um, it's changed this, COVID-19 has definitely changed the landscape of our lives. But I think one of the takeaways from this is that people are, older people are not disposable. This is not the world of the giver. Um, <laughs> we don't just get rid of our old people. We are only as good as the stories we tell ourselves. And they are living history in many cases. And our society is only good, as good as the story we, we write together. We are only as good as the story we tell ourselves and society is only as good as the story that we write together. So forgetting often means just repeating the past and repeating the past means stagnating. And so I think that we need to avoid doing that. I think it's important also to note that emotional resilience has to accompany physical resilience. So I kind of, um, I don't know if this is my term, it's probably not my concept, but um, I've come up with this term resilience delay and I think it's kind of useful for thinking about how resilience works. So it works like this. You have to admit that you're down before you can rise back up. And you have to allow yourself time to recover your strength before you can rise. So you have to really be mindful um, to be resilient. I like to think of resilient. I, I know we started this presentation with talking about resilience as bouncing back, but I like to think of bouncing up, not back. So failure is an opportunity for reevaluation. Do you really want to bounce back to just where you were before? Or can you be more? We can choose to separate our accomplishments from our sense of self-worth. You are not the sum of your successes and failures. You are more than that. And that's a, an important first step. Bouncing up rather than back really 
if you think about it long enough, it's the only viable option for our species. We can never go back to once what once was. We're never going to be back to, to where we were before this hit us, but we can do better. We can allow every failure that we encounter to help us be more. So bouncing up means taking chances. And I think that's an important thing to acknowledge. I, I noted that I'm adventurous and I feel that that's an important trait in all of us. It's the trailblazers that drive our species forward. And if you do what you've always done, you're gonna get what you've always got. Okay, so how do I do this resilience thing anyway? I think that it's not, it's not, it's not a perfect, it's, it's not a perfect system. It's, it's not do this X, Y, Z, and you're suddenly resilient, but it all starts with being patient with yourself. You have to counter your negative thoughts with positive ones. And my rule is two positive thoughts for every negative thought because your brain does play tricks on you. See yourself succeeding and surround yourself with people who also see you succeeding. Give yourself the time to feel down. Remember the resilience delay. It's okay to feel down. Lean into it and take the time that you need to rise. Meditate. So seriously, I have gotten so much benefit from meditating and I strongly recommend it to everyone. Concentrate on your breath. When you concentrate on your breath, you know you're in the present moment. You can't be in the past. You can't be in the future. You're right, you're right now. And that's where the magic of resilience truly happens. And lastly, live your life. The more you live, explore, and question, the more you fall. And the more you fall, the more you'll learn to get back up and be even more brilliant the second time around. So you're descended from survivors and really just want to end with this, you got this. So thank you for listening. Yay, yay, yay. Oh my gosh, Amanda. I feel like that was exactly what I needed to hear. Thank you so much for those I mean, how did you fit that all into your time limit? I don't know how you just did that, but that was- I don't know either. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> you know, but you know, we could follow along with you. Um, really great. Thank you so much for, you know, giving that gift to us. I mean, I really truly think that sometimes we, we have those days and you're like, yeah, I'm rocking it. I'm doing great. And then you're like, my couch is my only friend. So um, for those of you who can, you know, relate, thank you again to Amanda. Um, I'm sure she'll be here through the coffee break and after if you guys have more questions or want to reach out to her about res resiliency. Um, this is exactly what we're here for is to, you know, be resources to each other, share ideas. So I'm sure Amanda is happy to have people reach out if you guys have questions or want to share triumphs or um you know, just, just pass on the love and support to our communities. That's one of the many reasons we're doing our snail mail and uh, having these meetings every single week. So um, right now I want to jump into really couple quick um, life announcements. Um, our very own and lovely Jason Radford. Jason, can you wave your hand, Jason? Um, he had a birthday, guys. This was a big one. Jason turned 50 on Friday. Yay, Jason! We love you. We wish we could have been there to celebrate with you. Um, I talked to Jason on Friday and Saturday and said, as soon as you know it's safe to get kind of back out into the world, we all want to make sure that we're celebrating the birthdays, not only um, you know from this week, but the birthdays from all the the months we're going to be missing. So, um, and then my own little Zoe Randolph, she turned seven on Monday last week. So seven years old, I've officially had two kids for seven years and they're both alive. So, Hey, there's that. I think they still like me most of, most of the time. Um, and they, they promised me Jersey Mike sandwiches tonight. So, you know, it's all good. Um, Julie Wisman is going to break us out into some breakout rooms. So make sure I've got my, my coffee mug here ready to go for our breakout rooms. So Julie, whenever you're ready, we'd love to chat with each other. We'll see you guys in breakouts. 10 minutes.
We're how it all matches. Hello, hello. Everybody's working their way back. Yay. Yay. All right. Julie, did we get everybody back from the breakouts? Yeah. All right, we are going to have, I want to say, some more music. Yay! So, Jessica, we're going to have you play one more song for us and then get into our featured speaker. Um, Adrian will come and talk to us about some history of Kansas. But in the meantime, everybody, lend your ears for Miss Jessica is going to play for us again. Thank you. Um, I, wrote, I wrote this song. This is called How You Love Me. And I... Um, we recorded it in Seattle and we're getting ready to release the song and the music video and the rest of the album. Um, we had a, some big plans for a big album launch in June, but obviously Corona's pretty much tanked all of those plans. But we're hoping that releasing it digitally and uh, as a and with music videos will keep people maybe a, a, a little entertained. Um, but this song is um, about not being able to see yourself clearly and never being able to see another person clearly and reality constantly being this like obscured uh, image that we are, you know, filtering through the lenses of ourselves and our experiences. Um, this is how you love me. What do you know of light? Tucked away deep down inside. The darkness you deny killed us both this time. And every morning you've been gone. The sparrows sing their song, reminding me of what was lost. But time can't forget what you forgot. And oh, how you love me so. Don't you see, it's not quite what it seems. Don't you see, you're not quite what you'd like to believe yourself to be. The flies gather on our plate. Taking what's good of what remains. And I slowly forget your face. I let go 
of the tears that still remain. And oh, how you love me. So high above me, so you believe. But don't you see? It's not quite what it seems. Don't you see? You're not quite what you'd like to believe. Oh, how you love me so high above me, so you believe, but don't you see? It's not quite what it seems, don't you see? You're not quite what you'd like to believe. I'm not quite what I'd like to believe. It's never like we think it should be. Should it be? Should it be? Thank you. Oh, amazing. Jessica, thank you so much. I was just like zoning out. I love <laughs> the acoustic and the, your voice is just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to hear you again at the end. Um, but we are, oh my gosh, so many good things. Man, how do we choose? Luckily, there's a schedule. I'm just going to follow that. Um, up next, we are going to hear from Adrian Zink. Um, Adrian is a local Kansan. And he has studied for years and years and years um, history and lots of information about Kansas history. Um, so he uh, had on his bios here, he loves digging up and digging up and telling stories about overlooked and forgotten stories from history. So um, Adrian, if you could, we will have you present for us now. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, everybody, I just unmuted myself. Hi, I'm Adrian Zink. Thanks for having me. I want to give a shout out to Clay and Melanie for uh, hooking me up with you guys. Uh, Melanie and I go way back. We're from the same hometown. And uh, so um, I'm going to talk about Hidden History of Kansas. I'm going to start off telling a little bit about myself and uh, that uh, getting a history degree can actually work out sometimes. So oh. <laughs> yeah, how about that? So uh, I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation, then I'll tell you, uh, I'll, I'll read you a few stories from my book, Hidden History of Kansas. All right, let me get in here. Okay, can you guys see what I am doing? All right, are we good? Give me a thumbs up. You guys see my, all right. So Hidden History of Kansas. Um, this this is a long journey to get to this point. Uh, I studied history at KU, and uh, uh, all my friends were studying engineering and medicine and all those things that are you know you should study for career futures. And they kept asking me, "What are you going to do with history?" I said, "I I don't know. I'll figure it out as I go." And I did. Uh, I had the opportunity to study abroad in in the Czech Republic and Poland and Hungary. I got to study in different archives around Europe. Here's me holding a treaty that uh, Napoleon signed in 1809. Uh, I've moved on to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I did grad school at Marquette University in UW-Milwaukee. And when I was there, I fell in love with archives. I got to work with J.R.R. Tolkien's personal papers there in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's a long story, but I got to do preservation work on original Hobbit manuscripts. It was a lot of fun, and it made me realize I'm not I'm not leaving this profession. I'm gonna stick with this, and um, I I went on to uh, do heraldry for people, doing their their family crests and studying their family histories for them. I had my own kind of business for a while doing that, and I thought, hey, these are cool. I should look up my family crest. Pretty pretty lame uh, guy with a raincoat and blue flowers in front of a hill, but. Um, it was a lot of fun uh, doing that kind of research. Um, I went on, I came back to Kansas in 2011. I became the administrator of Mine Creek Battlefield Historic Site. 
It was the site of a major civil war battle right after the Battle of Westport, which happened in Kansas City. So I, when I was there, I got the idea to write a hidden history of Kansas book. And I finally wrote it in 2016, 2017. This is my first book. So uh, I, I uh, spending many days at that battlefield, I learned so much about Kansas history because uh, I was always researching, trying to find interesting stuff to tell my, my visitors. And later after working at that battlefield, I moved on to the National Archives of Kansas City where I, I work as an archivist right now. And so uh, if you go downtown to the National Archives of Kansas City, I might be there sometimes, but I'm usually in the caves in Lenexa or Subtropolis or Lee's Summit and you know, working underground. I work with a lot of patent files. I work with a lot of historic maps and records and uh, it's, it's really rewarding. So um, over the years, I've bounced around to a lot of places, a lot of jobs, but I found my love of history. And working at the archives uh, will lead me to my first story. I just did a whirlwind tour of me, but um, my first story is something I found out while studying US patent office files. It's called Auto Polo. Polo, but play with cars, what could possibly go wrong? The 1910s were an exciting time to be a vehicle enthusiast. Automobiles were quickly replacing the horse. Ford's Model T had just been released in 1908 and was well on its way to eventually selling 15 million units during its 19 year run. Motorcycle companies such as Indian and Harley Davidson were selling their products all over the nation, causing Americans to fall in love with the motorcycle. Kansas was not immune to this trend. Many car and motorcycle events and races entertained the public during the decade, including a record-breaking 100-mile motorcycle race in Norton. The wildest use of automobiles at that time and likely ever is the game of automobile polo, or auto polo for short. Officially invented in 1911 by a Ford dealer in Topeka named Ralph Hankinson, he came up with the game as a publicity stunt to sell cars. In this promotion, he promised the game of polo, but with cars instead of horses. At the July 20th, 1912 event, two teams squared off against each other. Two cars per team with two men inside each. In each car, the driver focused on getting to the ball and avoiding collisions while the mallet man hit the ball. You guys gotta imagine, there is a guy hanging out the side of a car with a mallet. The tops of the Model T cars and doors were removed for better visibility and so the mallet man could stand and swing the mallet. Over 5,000 spectators came to a Wichita alfalfa field to witness this wild spectacle. The concept for the sport had likely been around for a while, but Hankinson gets credit for the first widely publicized games. From then on, the sport exploded in popularity nationwide. Here's an auto polo team from Chicago. Here's a, a drawing of some of the action. You can imagine the injuries. <laughs> Roughly the length of a football field and half again as wide, the game could be played both outdoors and indoors. This gave the game a year-round audience and it became common nationwide in fairs, exhibitions, and even major arenas like Madison Square Garden. It was so damaging to the cars that Ralph Hankinson even patented the first roll bar on the back of the vehicle to prevent the players from being crushed. You see that roll bar on the back right there? That's it. There's, you can see the roll bar on the backs of these cars as well. And uh, I came across this uh, by looking at a roll bar patent so you can see it here as well, they're flipping over all the time. When I was working, I was working uh, with uh, automobile patents a couple years ago, and I came across the, the roll bar patent. I was like, what, what, what's up with this roll bar patent? I talked to one of my fellow archivists. He said, oh yeah, there was a game. There was a, some kind of polo game they played back then. And I looked up Ralph Hankinson. I was like, dude, this guy's from DeSoto, and I'm writing a book about Kansas history right now. Jackpot. So uh, this game exploded popularity coast to coast. It was described by many in the press as the lunatic game. Cars would constantly throw riders out of them, roll over and repeatedly collide. Mostly riders had cuts and broken bones and deaths were rare, but they did happen. People did die doing this. This is before, you know, laws about <laughs> automobiles for the most part. So sponsored by Texaco, Hankinson, he took his teams to the Philippines, the United Kingdom, all over Europe to promote and recruit. Uh, teams from Wichita even toured Europe in 1913 to much fanfare. The game chugged on into the late 1920s, but the high cost of repairing and replacing the cars eventually did end the sport. The public had other avenues for entertainment now, as well with the rise of basketball, football, and the cinema. Fewer auto polo promoters were willing to cough up the money for something so expensive as well. Hankinson's teams in 1924, according to archives in Topeka, they recorded 538 burst tires, 66 broken axles, 1,564 broken wheels, 10 cracked engines, and six cars that were just totaled. 
After World War II, the game made a small comeback, but then it faded away forever. So the next time you see a demolition derby, NASCAR race, or monster trucks, keep in mind that's kind of child's play compared to auto polo. Modern people like to look at the past as stuffy and uptight, but this game showed the opposite is true. You couldn't get an insurer to back this sport today, let alone the legal rights to do it in any arena. And I know this from personal experience. Uh, for a couple of years, I was an insurance agent here in town at Haas and Wilkerson Insurance. We did amusement insurance. Sprint Center would not touch this. They don't want people dying <laughs> at their arena. So this uh, is uh, one of my favorite uh, things I ever researched in Kansas history. And you can actually see some footage of an auto polo game in Hibbings, Minnesota. It's on YouTube. It's from like 1915. You can look that up. So that is auto polo. My next story. Oh, here, here's a, more of the action. My next story is about Boston Corbett. And a lot of you might not have heard of this guy, but he is the guy that shot John Wilkes Booth after the Civil War, or after Booth assassinated President Lincoln. So uh, Boston Corbett has a Kansas connection and it's pretty wild. It's one of the, it's one of the most interesting side stories in American history. So when John Wilkes Booth assassinated President Abraham Lincoln on April 14th, 1865, the largest manhunt in American history commenced. Over 10,000 federal troops and innumerable civilians assisted in the search for the assassin. Now, we all know this story, you know, I mean, about Lincoln and Booth, we all heard that. But you know what inspired me to dig more into this? A book about recreations of assassinations made by Legos. It's a book my son had. I was like, what is this? And this guy recreates different assassinations and assassination attempts with Legos. It's quite crude, but it's sometimes interesting. And he talked a little bit about Boston Corbett in there. And I was thinking, oh man, I remember this guy from studying up uh, on Kansas history. So Corbett was a member of the 16th New York Cavalry. They caught up with uh, John Wilkes Booth on April 26th. You know, uh, over 10 days later at the tobacco farm of Richard H. Garrett in Northern Virginia. So massive manhunt, they finally caught Booth. After setting fire to the barn to flush out Booth, Corbett snuck up behind the barn and shot him through the back of the head in a, through a crack in the barn. Booth was carried out of the burning barn, dying two hours later on Garrett's porch. When the nation learned of who killed Booth, Corbett was seen by many in the media and the public as a hero. Though he directly disobeyed Secretary of War Edwin Sands' orders to capture Booth alive. Little did they know what a character Corbett was. So this guy was instantly famous. He is, he is Lincoln's Avenger. He is a hero, right? Even though he would disobey orders. They wanted to capture him alive because maybe he was part of conspiracy and maybe he'd talk and squeal, which he would have because, you know, he wasn't one of like 10 people involved in this conspiracy. So, but yeah, he's a hero. Keep that in mind. Everyone loves this guy now. Born in London, Corbett immigrated to New York in 1839 and was apprenticed as a hatter during his youth. What do you guys know about 19th century hat making? Well, if you've ever studied up on it, hatters of the air were exposed to dangerous amounts of mercury nitrate fumes when treating hat felt, which may have led to this man's later psychosis and hallucinations. His erratic behavior could definitely be tied to his profession. Mad Hatter, everybody? That's where the stereotype comes from because they everyone just had the stereotype though people make hats are crazy. Well, they 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 come by it honestly because of the mercury. A deeply religious man, he was known to randomly proselytize the people on the street and to scold co-workers who swore in his presence, followed by singing or praying for them. In 1858, he was once so mortified by a pair of prostitutes propositioning him that he castrated himself with a pair of scissors to avoid temptation. He sought medical treatment later only after having a meal and going to a prayer meeting. Now I know that's a crowd pleaser, but I got to tell that story because it's part of his story. And it's just letting you know, this guy is not, is not working with, with, a, with a very stable mind. And I, I have kind of a soft spot for him because of that. You know, he, he didn't mean to get mercury poisoning. After the Civil War, he read a rambling incoherent life, preaching around the country and being fired from numerous jobs after stopping work to pray or scream at co-workers. He was sometimes cashing on his fame as Lincoln's Avenger, but he was never invited back to groups he spoke to due to his erratic behavior. Increasingly paranoid that the government was out to get him for killing Booth, he began carrying a gun everywhere. He was even kicked out of an army reunion for pulling his gun on men who questioned his accounts of Booth's death, 
he would also branch at people branch his gun at people who just looked at him funny he would just pull it out random random places there's lots of stories of that it was in this frame of mind he came to kansas settling near concordia in 1878 he built himself a dugout home in the ground and worked as a traveling preacher his fame as lincoln's avenger often outran his reality as a mentally disturbed man and in january 1887 he was offered a job so if if you're if you're wondering about this um who would hire him really he had an old army but he felt a little sorry for him and so he was hired of course as an assistant doorkeeper at the kansas house of representatives in topeka those trusting Kansans thought they'd hired themselves quite the national celebrity to protect the esteemed leaders of the state. His old army buddy went to the leaders of the state and was like, do you guys realize Lincoln's Avenger, Boston Corbett, is living in a hole in the ground, barely scraping by as a traveling preacher? And they're like, oh my God, let's give him a job as a security guard. He's a, he's a hero. They had no idea um, what, how unstable he was. But just not too long after, on February 15th, he pulled his revolver out and chased the other officers of the house from the building, convinced they were discriminating against him, left him up on the balcony and everyone running for cover. He was soon placed in the Topeka Asylum for the Insane. The next year, though, on May 26th, this is from the Kansas State Archives, Insane Man Escape. He made a daring escape on horseback. They were out walking in the yard, and he literally just left, walked across the street, stole a horse, and rode off into the sunset. No one's sure what happened to him after this. As an old war friend in Neo Dosho, he told him he was heading to Mexico. There's evidence he might've died in a fire called the Great Hinkley Fire in 1894 in Eastern Minnesota. A name Boston Corbett shows up on the names of the dead, but we don't know if that's him. So I kind of I kind of like to think that he had like a Shawshank Redemption ending and he met up you know, in Mexico with his buddy and he lived out the rest of his life, but we really don't know. And uh, I, 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 hope he, I hope he lived out his last days, you know, doing okay but uh one of my favorite stories from kansas history and uh so um a little bit about uh my background uh, leads me to my my uh third and uh final story i don't want to take up too much time i think of 20 minutes right um my mother and father did foster care my whole life they still do and so um, a lot of a lot of times my dad was either guarded a prison or he painted houses and my mom did foster care so we didn't have a lot of money really and also with foster kids you can't just like take them on vacations or anything Jamaica or whatever so for our like trips we would just go drive around Kansas and go to random towns and see interesting sites and I remember this place from when I was a boy and I wanted to write about it because I don't see it enough in Kansas history it's a story a very inspiring one about this about oh here's a Boston Corbett's dugout today by the way but it's about uh Miss Susanna Salter of Argonia Kansas and uh I thought this is a perfect one to end on because it's Mother's Day and she is a total badass mother um but she's more than that and if you've never heard of her she's the first woman ever elected as a mayor of any town or city in the United States and the way it happened is quite interesting and the way she reacted to it is really cool. So it took decades for the women's suffrage movement to gain ultimate success in 1920 when women were finally granted the right to vote nationwide. Kansas was not immune to these movements and had its own local suffrage chapters. You guys gotta remember, Kansas was very progressive in the late 1800s. Um, it was very, uh, I mean, it was, it was pro-North, it was abolitionist. Uh, the suffragette movement had a lot of had a lot of uh, strength in the state, and um, in 1877, women in Kansas gained the right to vote in city municipal elections, and it didn't take long for their influence to be felt. Now, keep in mind, this is not you can't vote for statewide office, no no governor, they cannot vote for president, senator, Congress. This is a baby step. It's just city municipal elections that they that women were granted the right to vote in and that they fought for. Um, so. This woman, Susanna Medora Salter, was a wife and mother of young children in Argonia, population 500. It's down by Wichita, where she worked as an officer in the local Women's Christian Temperance Union. Some of the men in town thought it'd be funny to put her name on the Prohibition Party ticket for mayor, thinking she would lose. She, this was a prank. She didn't really know about this. You know, she didn't know uh, she was going to be put on this ballot. And these guys were incensed at the intrusion of female voters into their domain. 
Little did they realize she'd actually win with two thirds of the vote on April 4th, 1877. This election came just weeks after women were enfranchised. Both the local offices were won by women too, showing the power of their vote. This is a letter to her from the outgoing mayor saying, Miss, Miss Salter, you're, you're duly elected as a uh, mayor, um, report to duty. And she was like, wait, excuse me? So uh, yeah, she, she won and she was elected. So though not expecting to ever be mayor and not even originally seeking the office, she performed her duties pretty well. She was also no fool. She was only six weeks shy of graduating college at Kansas State Agricultural College, what we now know as Kansas State University, when she fell ill and had to drop out. She brooked no nonsense during her meetings and was no novice to politics either. Though she was just 27 years old, her father was the town's first mayor and her father-in-law, Neville Salter, was once a lieutenant governor of Kansas. Her husband was city clerk once as well, so she totally knew how everything worked. Some of the men who put her up for the nomination were city council members themselves. And they're surprised when she opened the first meeting by saying, gentlemen, what is your pleasure? You're the duly elected officials of this town and I'm merely your presiding officer. The men were surprised how well she did and how well she got along with everyone. She served an uneventful year as mayor, but guys, she was a international sensation and curiosity. I mean, this is like hoop skirt era stuff. To them, a woman's place was, you know, of course in the home, but also, more as a spiritual leader. Women were seen as the upholders of morality in Victorian times. They saw men as the rough, rough, uh, rough fools out there, you know, running the machines and keeping this thing going, but women were there to keep us moral, but they're not to lead us necessarily. That's how they saw it. So, um, but you know, so this blew everyone's minds. She got congratulatory mail from all over America and also from many European nations. Newspaper men from the coasts came to Argonia to write about her. One New York reporter wrote, I asked Mrs. Salter if her ambition to act as a female politician or leader in women's suffrage circles had been aroused by her election. She quickly replied, no, indeed, I shall be very glad when my term of office expires. And I shall be only too happy, therefore, to devote myself entirely as I have always done to the care of my family. And in, and in a conversation with a number of businessmen in Argonia, uh, this reporter found a very general disposition for these men to rest on the laurels now one is the only American town which tried the experiment of a woman mayor. So to them, they're like, look at us. We're so progressive. We tried this experiment and we're so famous. Like, yeah, well, it, you did it as a joke and you guys are jerks, but um, it turned out pretty well it, all in all. And she showed that it could be done. And a lot of people wanted her to run for national office or, or you know, if that could be a thing eventually. They also wanted her to like Elizabeth Cady Stanton. All these people wanted her to be a leader and go around the country and speak. But she was just kind of like, no, I just, I didn't even want this. I'm just doing it because I got elected. So um, once her term expired, she declined to ever run for office again. Her family and her, they relocated to Oklahoma where she lived to the ripe old age of 101. Not bad, right? <laughs> she did return, return to Argonia though in 1933 to be honored with a bronze memorial plaque on a stone base in the public square. America's first female mayor started as a joke, but ended as a dignified success. And one of my favorite parts, in addition, during office, she gave birth to her fourth child. So she was just like an all around badass. And um, I got a couple more slides about her. Here's uh, one of the uh, articles about her um, from the Boston Globe. Susanna Medora Salter is a striking example uh, of the possibilities for women in Kansas. She's the wife of a successful lawyer, the mother of four lusty children. I don't think they're using the word lusty like we do today, more like rumptious. <laughs> Mayor of town of Argona and only 27 years old. So, but got people writing about her in Germany, like South Africa, Australia. It was, it was a big deal. Um, there was a big push uh, to put her on the $10 bill years ago. I'm talking uh, 15, 10, 10, 15 years ago. And I remember being part of this and uh, they, they were talking about um, replacing uh, Hamilton on the 10. And people, people in different states were putting different uh, things forward, like, you know, maybe Harry Tubman. And so Kansas sent Susanna Salter and we had this mock-up. But of course this comes out and, uh, you know, ruins all that. So everyone's like, oh yeah, Hamilton, he's cool again. Now we like it. Because for a long time, they're like, no one cared about Hamilton. Like, well, let's take him off the 10. But that play kind of solidified him in everyone's minds again. 
So um, that is my Hidden History of Kansas presentation. I have another book that came out last November called Wicked Kansas. It's about more of the, the salacious side of state history and uh, the, more, the more seedy characters, the thieves, the con artists, the train robbers. And uh, you can find both books online, just Google it. And they're on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other places. And uh, you can find me online. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I also have a website. And uh, guys, thanks for listening. I have probably about 60 more stories like that in the book and hope you learned a little something about Kansas history. There's a lot out there like that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was one of our questions was, please make sure we know how we can reach out, get your books. Um, I, I did a super quick search on Amazon and he just popped right up. So make sure you remember that name, Adrian Zink. Um, Adrian, such cool stories. Like I'm one of those people that I did not do well with like dates in history. I'm like, I'm happy if I remember my kid's birthday and what year I, you know, started a job, let alone, you know, when people in history were around. So thank you for making that not only interesting, but also relatable to cool stuff we actually could find interesting and in the city, you know, that we live in and around. So really awesome. Thank you so much. We hope to hear from you again in the future, um, especially if we were ever able to, you know, get back in person. We'd love to see you and hear more stories from you about um, the great state of Kansas. And I totally want to hear more about the cool jobs you've had. You know, just I'm sure you've stumbled across cool things in your times um, in like your cool cave job. So um, please make sure you're saving some of those stories for us, um, especially I, I personally want to hear a lot more about Lord of the Rings because I'm a huge nerd. Yeah, I'm sure we have plenty of nerds here in our community. So um, let me see if there's any other questions here. Um, oh, somebody said that you should do a drunk history session. So I don't know if that would be an Oasis sponsored event, but if you do post one, please let us know. We would love to, you know, circle that around the um, Oasis community. I'm sure we'd enjoy those types of things. Um, All right. And then uh, somebody was asking a little bit more, can you just touch a tiny bit on those caves in Lenexa? Uh, there was some sort of historic caves in Lenexa, maybe that you were, one of your jobs was located in some of those old caves. Uh, there are different caves all over the city, you know, but there's about 30 underground business parks. Um, but the one I met is a modern cave built in like, it's, it's dug out of limestone in like 2003. It's not oh. a historic cave, but it's, but it's near uh, 95th and Renner. But yeah, there are some other caves over near there that are blocked off that were used for, you know, mining limestone back in the day. And, uh, but I'm not a total expert on that. I mean, I'm from Western Kansas. So, you know, originally, and I've moved around a lot. So, okay. but you know, over, over time, I've learned more and more about this area, this city. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of Kansas City in the book as well. Cause you can't talk about Kansas without talking about Kansas City and Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri comes up quite a bit because a lot of stuff happened on both sides of the state line. If I'm going to talk about Ernest Hemingway, his story is on both sides of the state line, you know, for example. Well, that is so fascinating. Thank you for making history something I was interested in um, because a lot of times I just, not going to lie, kind of don't care. But I was super interested in everything you had to say. So you did a great job of teaching us. Thank you. Um, we are going to transition uh, kind of back to our main programming and hear one more time from Jessica. Um, at this time, I would like to remind everybody that OASIS is a 501c3. Uh, we are a volunteer run and volunteer donate supported organization. So make sure that we are turning your hands into problem solving hands this week by helping us to fund a space for our secular community to thrive. Um, recurring donations are the most helpful, but of course, any amount that you could um, give us, even if it's just that one time uh, today, you can give at kcoasis.org slash donate, or you can also give by text at 816-839-7656. And um, I bet you anything, if I ask really nicely, Julie might put the link for our donate page in that chat box there. Um, and then 
if there's no other questions, we are going to let uh, Jessica play us out and um, we'll have one last, uh, oh, before we do Jessica real quick, sorry. Um, I did want to say, make sure you guys uh, put a timer on, schedule in your calendar. We'll be at the same Zoom link next week. Our very own Erin Guerra from our Kansas City Oasis is going to be teaching us all about tabletop games and how he's been learning about that during social distancing. Um, Nate Bailey is going to give our community moment and we're going to have music from Colleen Diker. So make sure you guys are tuned in next week at 11, same Zoom meeting. Uh, Julie did put that link there in the donate box and I know somebody had linked in their uh, Venmo for Jessica. So of course all of our musicians have been pretty dramatically um, affected by their music playing, reaching the masses ability. So please, 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 if you enjoyed Jessica's music as much as I did, uh, follow along and let's all send her a little bit of extra monetary love through Venmo today. So with that, Jessica, please take us away and play us out. Thank you guys. Um, this last song is called Follow Along. It's just about the power of the human imagination. And also I've been seeing notifications scroll through my phone from Venmo. So all of the, all of the Venmo love is, is super appreciated. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I really love listening to you guys every time I play for Oasis and have gotten to hear the talk. It's always been really interesting. And um, anyway, it was just great to spend my morning with you um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Follow all the left in your own mind. Once you start knocking on open doors while the thoughts they rush in like a thundering horde, they all start to waltz and dance around the room. You sit and you wish that you could dance too. But la 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 left in your own mind. It's so strange sometimes. Left in your own mind. You just wanna la la all the time. It walks in friends, you forgot you knew Once a child, once a mother, the last one is you Before you can stop and ask them anything Your friends just join in the dancing And you just fall alone in your own mind It's so strange sometimes Left in your own mind you just want to love her all the time. La 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 Peek in the keyhole, blow off the dust from the great wealth of thinking you love so much. Pull up your skirts, tails and dance a little jig. Let these winds lead you to a life that you've never led. You've never lived. You just fall in love, 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 love. La 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 that's, that's it. No more beautiful music for you people today. You'll have to go on. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to say um, another thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our guests. Um, Adrian, Amanda, and Jessica made this an awesome, awesome uh, Sunday morning. Thanks to you all. 
Um, another special thanks to all of the people who helped get us here today, uh, specifically Julie Wisman, uh, Nikki and our board, JJ helping with music, um, Galen and our technical team getting um, the advertisements and those links out there. Um, we hope you guys have a wonderful week. Give love to your mother figures in your life. And we thank you guys all for being here and making community what it is. We love you and we'll see you guys next week.